All right, let's get going again. Boy, it's such a privilege to be able to share this information. I'm so thankful to John and Wayne for being able to share this stuff with you. And the main thing is to, to emphasize that researching the Word, working the Word, is not this big old head trip. It's where we get our hands dirty. We get our heart involved. We put on our hip boots. We see the Word work in some of the most dire circumstances in people's lives that we'll never see unless we get in there and love. And then we'll see the word work. We'll be able to apply it under all circumstances. And another concept along the same line is to understand what research is. Because we like to talk about how we research God's word, and many people don't understand what research really is. You see, there's actually two kinds of research. There's research and there's research <laughs> I've been teaching this for quite a while but the first kind the research is to rework or to renew or to reestablish or review something that we think we already know we do that in order to reaffirm or deepen our understanding to to make it versatile so we can apply it under all circumstances where you can teach the fellowship when everyone really wants to hear the word or you can teach the fellowship when everyone's distracted when everyone's up or when everyone's down where you can apply it in your life when things are hunky-dory and there's not a lot of resistance or when you can apply it in your life when you got to dig in with both feet and it still works see that's research, getting involved with it again. Now, there, the other form, the research, is a quest to find something new. Most of the time when people think about research, they think about that, going out in the unknown and how oh, important it might be to discover something or whatever. Well, this class is not in that vein. This particular class on working the word is a re search class we're going to review a lot of foundational verses and see how we can deepen our understanding and the primary rule of all research is you can't ever afford to think that you know everything that can be known about a verse you just you can never get to that place you have to maintain that meekness because there's no place for a know-it-all in meekness and Meekness means to be humble, to be not arrogant, to be teachable, coachable. See, Meekness does not imply weakness at all. In fact, in Numbers 12.3, it says Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth. Well, can you imagine any form of weakness in Moses? <laughs> meekness is not weakness. It's being humble, coachable, teachable. See, his heart... Moses' heart was open to God. He was willing to learn. Now, the second thing when it comes to research you have to understand is you have to be a workman. It takes work. you got to get involved. And sometimes this involves the tedium of working with details. God's Word's precise, so you can never allow your mind to fall asleep at the switch because it's often a detail that's the key between truth and error. We have to work it so that we have that word of truth and it comes when we, we are precise. So we can say, this is this and that is that. That's what orthotomonta is, to cut it precisely, to cut it right, to cut it straight. And that involves details. But if you're disciplined to look at details, then that principle will transfer into other things in your life, just like riding a bicycle. When you learn how to ride a bicycle then you're halfway to learning how to ride a motorcycle, right? Because it's the same principles, see? So if you learn detail consciousness, that principle will transfer into other parts of your life and bear fruit. But what is research? The re part of research. Well, look at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 
chapter 3. And in verse 4, we covered this once before, we'll look at it again. It says, whereby, when you read, you may understand. The word read means experience it again. The again part is the re in research, to experience it again. Not just do it once, but again and again and again. Not under the same circumstances, but under all circumstances. To be that professional believer that can apply it under all circumstances. So you can shoot the basket from the foul line, or you can shoot the basket when the defender's in your face. You can shoot the basket and get the goal under all circumstances. Philippians chapter 3 and in verse 1. Finally, my brother, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not irksome. It's not irksome, but for you, it is safe. It's the same things. There he is teaching that old teaching again. It's not irksome. It's safe. It helps you get established. Research is safe. Titus 1.9. Titus 1.9. It says, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. As he hath been taught is the first time you heard it. Holding it fast is the re part. See? You hold it fast. You go over it again in your mind. You put it into your heart. Because in, in order for anything to get down into your heart, you have to dwell on it in your mind. The dwelling is the re part in research. And then if you do that, you'll be able to, by sound doctrine, exhort and convince the guys that are in your face when you're trying to shoot the shot, the gainsayers, so that you'll be able to apply the word not only when things are hunky-dory, but you'll be able to be effective when things are tough. And you only get there by doing research to make sure you don't have a form of basketball but deny the power thereof, <laughs> right? Where you think you have the doctrine. Oh, I know the mystery. I know the doctrine. But if you don't apply it, do you really know it? No, see? So it's holding it fast. That's the re part. Whatever it takes to hold it fast, that's research. That's research. Hearing it again, that's research. Reading it again, that's research. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. It says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. So, the things that you have heard of me, that's the first time. The same commit to faithful men, that's the re part. Research is not only understanding the word, but it's understanding how to teach it, how to convey it. It's not only understanding the word, but it's understanding how to apply it, how to talk to people and convince people of the truth. That's all research. It's all practical application, how to do it under all these different circumstances. That's research. That's neat, isn't it? Yeah. Wow. And then, of course, God's Word is wonderful because it has this, this idiosyncrasy. It has this trait that God's Word profits both immediately and ultimately. It gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Bread to the eater is the immediate need. Seed to the sower is the ultimate need that keeps going and going and going. Same thing is true here. The same commit thou to faithful men, and then it keeps on going and going. Who shall be able to teach others also? See, you just keep on teaching the true word, and it will produce the results, and then people will be able to teach others also because you're just not parroting what you've heard. It says the same, but it's the same in all of its manifestations applied under all levels 
And then you'll be able to teach others also, see? You'll be able to help them under all circumstances. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. And in verse 13, he says, Yea, I think it's meat. I think it's adequate, necessary, as long as I am in this human body, this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. The remembrance is the re part in research, remembering it again, stirring, kindling, getting people back into it, getting them to understand it with the same understanding that they first understood it with, and that hopefully they'll keep understanding it if they keep applying. That's rekindling. It's research. Chapter 3, and in verse 1, it says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write to you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. The, your pure minds, that's the, the word dianoia, and that's like your memory banks. And stir up is to stimulate that memory, is to get people to remember. Okay, I, I say it's, it's to annoy your dianoia. <laughs> okay, it's, it's to get people's remembrance kindled. It's that key that gets them to remember, by which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. So motivating people to do the word, to remember it, to apply it, that busyness, that activity is the re part in research. They heard it once. Now, what's involved in getting them to remember it again so they can apply it? That's research. 2 Timothy 2.15. We were there once. We'll just go back there for a moment and look at it from this facet. 2 Timothy 2 and in verse 15. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. The workman part is the re part. So you study, you get busy, you get involved, and then you work. The workman part is the re part of research. James chapter 1. This is a good one. Hebrews, James chapter 1, verse 2. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. What is he, nuts? <laughs> What is he nuts? No. You know why? This is the re part. You get to apply what you've learned now. You have an opportunity. It's fun when everyone at fellowship is happy and everything's working fine in their lives and it's great. And then somebody comes to fellowship and they're all bummed out. Well, that's a wonderful opportunity. Count it all joy. Now there's a need. Now you can see the word work. See? Now your, your ministry in the body can kick in. There's a need. Count it all joy when you fall into all these things. When it happens. Knowing this, that the trying of your believing works endurance. The testing of your believing. Every time you believe for something, does it happen right then immediately? No, there's sometimes a period of time. Well, that period of time is where it, the word for that, the operative word for that is patience. You just remain faithful. You remain under the word in subjection. You do what the word says until you get the result. So, And the trying of your believing works patience because you know what happened last time and, it, and, and the word came to pass. It did work. So, and, the, and the last time before that, you believed in it, and it happened, right? And the time before that, it, it really did. It took a while, but it did happen, right? Okay, so then you build that endurance. You build that patience. You know it's going to happen, so you don't freak out. You don't bug out. You don't quit, see? But let patience have her complete work. Keep on going until you get the result. That you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Well, when are you perfect and entire, wanting nothing? When you've gotten the result, see, that's the re 
part. The discipline of going through, keeping on when there's a need until you get it. Right? That's learning, isn't it? Sure. There's some mental things you have to do. There's some other things you need to do. That's research, being able to get the result. Right? Verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, what's wisdom? Knowledge applied. See, it fits. Let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and abrades not. But let him ask in how? Believing. Faith or believing. Nothing wavering. You keep on being patient. You keep on going. For he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he will receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We don't want to be double-minded, right? We want to be able to get the understanding from the Word and then get the results that, it need, that we need in our life. So that's why we should count it all joy because that's research. See, we're a research ministry. We want to get into the Word and see how it works. See, under all circumstances. James chapter 1, verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only. That doing, after you've heard it, that doing is the re part. See? Verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridles not his tongue, all they do is just talk, they don't do, but deceives his own heart, how does he deceive his own heart? Earlier it says to deceive yourself would be to hear it and not do it. So if anyone's among you and seems to be religious, okay, they have some sort of godliness about them in one way or another, but if they just talk, 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 and don't do, this man's religion is what? Vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is doing something about it. Visiting the fatherless and widows in their affliction and seeing the word work. That's research. See it? That's tremendous. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. And in verse 6. Boy, there's a whole vista of stuff that we missed out on thinking that research was just some big knowledge trip. That's just the smallest, that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's just the beginning. We want to seek. We want to cry after knowledge. We want to get it all the way so we can apply it and not just be sitting up here in this chair with all this knowledge and not, having, not doing anything, not having any impact. No, we want to do something about it so people get results in their life so we can see that glory and that virtue, which is the goal of the knowledge, like it said in 2 Peter. Anyway, Colossians chapter 2 and in verse... Six. It says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk. The walking is the re part. We received it once, now you apply it. And what happens? You get rooted, you get built up, you get established in the faith. Isn't that what we want? How do you get there? Walk. And then what's going to happen in your life? Abounding therein with what? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is that symptom that everything's going well. <laughs> right? It's that end result that you're blessed. We want the end result. And we do it as we have been taught. As you have been taught, that's the first part. The re part is walking. The re part is being rooted. The re part is being built up. The re part is being established. And then we'll get that result. And we'll be blessed. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 verse 9. This is what research is all about. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment that you may approve things that are excellent that you may test things that differ 
you'll know what the real McCoy is. See? We abound in knowledge, but also we abound in judgment. And that is that practical awareness, that discernment that can only come when you've applied it. Like it said in Proverbs, discretion will preserve you. That's after you've applied it, after you've done all those things, when you get that understanding. When you can see a situation and you go, I know what the answer is. All the complicated things going on, but you know, you've seen it before and you know what to do. You have that great understanding that you can test things that differ so that then you can be genuine and without offense. You won't, get, you won't have any cause of stumbling till the day of Christ. Being filled with the fruit, you get the results of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ under that great goal. We all want the glory and praise of God. That's research, getting involved, applying it so that you can ethically evaluate situations so that you can see what's right. You can discern and make sure you don't get tripped up. See, that's research. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter, chapter 2, and in verse 1, it says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and, and, all, or, and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. See, this, this is parallel with James. You put apart that superfluity of naughtiness, Right? Then you can receive the word because you don't have any encumbrance. So you lay apart, lay aside all malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, all that stuff. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. You hear the word, you apply it, and then you grow. The growing is the re part in research. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse 5. And besides this, giving all diligence. See, and this is in that same context where it talked about that knowledge that God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And we can get that glory and virtue and those exceeding great and precious promises, and escape the world and the lust and the corruption and all that. But it goes on. And it says, besides this, giving all diligence, seek it. Spud us on. Add to your believing virtue, and a virtue, knowledge, and a knowledge, temperance, and a temperance, patience, and a patience, godliness, and a godliness, brotherly kindness, and a brotherly kindness, charity. So we, we keep on going. We apply it under all these circumstances. We add, with that diligence, we add to our believing virtue, where we get to the place where we have that superiority and excellence manifested in our life. And then we add to that virtue practical knowledge experience. And then we add to that practical knowledge experience Discipline. So you keep on applying it. And to that discipline, then we have patience. Because sometimes things don't work the way we want. But they will get there if we just keep on working. It takes maturity to have that patience. And to patience, godliness, where we have that relationship with God. You know, when you're believing for something, you pray for it, you believe it, you talk to God, and you develop that relationship with Him. And to godliness, brotherly love, love for the brethren, familial love, love like a family. And to that kind of love, then charity, the love of God in the renewed mind. It says, for if these things be in you and abound, the abounding is the re part. They will make you that you'll neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because you're going to get results the world can't stop you. You're not going to be barren. You're not going to be unfruitful because you'll be able to push up through all that crust and get the fruit that you desire in your life. 
But he that lacks these things, verse 9, is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. That sort of reflects back to James, deceiving themselves and forgetting what manner of man they were. How do people get that way? By not doing. See? Wherefore, the rather, verse 10, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, steadfast, rooted. For if you do these things, you shall never what? Fall. Fall. Wow. You want that in your life? That's research. And not only will you get that benefit, but also the next verse. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So when you get to the Bema, the next word you hear won't be next. <laughs> That's research. Acts 17. Acts 17. Verse 11. Boy, this is, this is great. We can get involved in the Word. There's whole vistas of stuff that we can apply ourselves. It's not boring to hear the same thing because you can get established. You can get to the point where you shall never fall. I think that's pretty good. <laughs> Acts 17, verse 11, it says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the Word with all readiness of mind, but what do they do? They searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So the searching the scriptures was the re part. See? Most of our Christian life can be spent in doing re search. But there is the other kind of re search to go off into the unknown to look for something new. But there's some important guidelines that you have to understand. First of all, principles transfer so that the, the work habits that you build doing research will then serve you well when you carry over into research. And, you know, when you, when you want to launch off into something new or whatever, um, that's not the primary goal, is it? No. Because if we're discovering new stuff all the time, well, how much did you know in the first place? <laughs> right? And you're not more important because of what you know. You're more important because of what you do. But there are some people who, who are motivated. They, they want to learn, and it's, it's good if you keep it in balance to go off and look for something new. But you have to have knowledge of the tools involved before you do it, right? I mean, if you, if you go off and climb a mountain or go down into a cave and do spelunking, you better know what your tools are, right? You better have proven your equipment. You just don't climb the Matterhorn the first day you went out on the mountain, do you? No. You have to prove your equipment. You have to find out what all those cables and carabiners and all those other things are for, right? You have to prove your equipment and your first aid kit and everything else so you know what to do in case it gets cold or in case it gets rainy or in case something else happens right? So that you can climb the mountain under all circumstances. And you learn about that by doing research. And you've proven your tools before you go off into the unknown. And another thing, a lot of people think that research is something that you go off and do by yourself. You know, you sequester yourself off in a back room and then come out months later with a beard and long hair and an answer or something. I don't know. <laughs> but... <laughs> When you go off into the mountain or into the cave, tell somebody where you're going. So if you get lost, they can come and find you. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, it is a family activity. You need to discuss your findings with others while you're working on the stuff so that you keep in balance. Otherwise, you'll come back with something strange that doesn't work. But you'll be convinced it's the truth. And that's a real situation to be in where you think something is light when it's actually darkness. Well, if it's actually darkness and you think it's light, boy, that darkness is really dark because you can't even tell it's dark. All right? And so you need to balance. You need to tell people where you're going 
so that when you come back all strange and weird, they'll be able to help you. <laughs> okay? Look at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. I mean, all that knowledge is there. Everything that Jesus Christ knew, he was the Word made flesh, the fullness, all that stuff, it's available to grow up into him. There's a lot of growth left. There's a lot of territory left places to go. It's unsearchable riches of Christ. So there's a whole lot of stuff available. But if you want to get that, in Ephesians chapter 3, in verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by believing, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend all that stuff, but it says, with all saints. You're going to need the other people in the body to work with, to bounce ideas off of, see. When you go off on your own, it doesn't work. We need others so that we can attain that knowledge. And in Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, and in verse 2, it says that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the full experiential knowledge of the mystery of God. We want that, don't we? We want to attain. We want to grow up. We want to get that full experiential knowledge. But in order to get there, you need the rest of the family, their hearts being knit together unto all the riches of the full assurance of understanding. It's part of that. You see, it's just like with all saints. So when you do research and you want to find something new, first of all, like it said in 2 Timothy 2.15, it says that we need not to be ashamed. Ashamed means disappointed in your expectation. So when you're studying something, you need to have an expectation, I believe. I believe that it's better to order what you study by need rather than by mere curiosity. Because if you are driven by, by supplying or, or fulfilling or solving a need, then you'll have something practical that you can apply right away. And you'll see if it works. Because if it ain't practical, if it don't work, it ain't right. But see, so many people, they, they study to, to, for curiosity's sake, knowledge for knowledge's sake, and there's not a readily applicable thing to go out and test your hypothesis to see if it's really true. So it's better, if you want to do research, if you want to get involved in the Word, then pick your topics based upon need. Don't pick them upon just mere curiosity. Then you'll be able to test it and see if it's true, see? Because you'll be able to apply it. If it don't work, it ain't right. <laughs> okay? So, now, what should we research? Well, of course, we research the Bible. Because man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of where? The mouth, the mouth of God. See, there's a lot of wonderful books about the Bible, and it's good to read one or read them every once in a while, but what's our main diet? Where do we get that filet mignon from? The Word of God. The Word of God. That's our main diet, see? And there's been billions of believers on the earth, and they've shared their religious experiences with others, and they've been inspiring, but can you expect the same things they expected? Sometimes, sometimes not, right? But the Bible contains believers' experiences that are normative. They made it into the book. Why? Because God wanted them in there because they're normative. They, they're, they're the standard. They're the things we can expect. See, And so we study what the Word says. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. We study this Word because it is profitable not other people's experiences, because we don't think like they do. We don't, didn't have the same kind of need that they had. God doesn't work with us the same way he worked with them. He's a personal God, right? Yeah. 
And so you can expect what the Word says to happen, but somebody else's experience, it may or may not. You understand what I'm saying? We don't study experiences. We don't base our knowledge upon experiences because experiences, I mean, you can look at a car wreck and there are going to be four witnesses of that car wreck and there'll be four different stories. And each person is telling the truth because that's what they saw. See, But when, you, when it's in the Word, you can look at all the aspects of it and understand it. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and in verse 16 it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable. It's profitable for right believing. How to believe correctly. And it's profitable for reproof. If you make a mistake and don't believe correctly and you start to apply it wrongly, then you need reproof. And that's what the Word does. It reproves us when we need it. And then also, it's profitable for correction. Sometimes people apply things wrongly for such a long time that they invent a new doctrine to substantiate it. That's when you need correction. And so many times the, the correction epistles have deeper understanding of the doctrine because you need that to reverse the process. And for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished. Thoroughly furnished. You have everything that you need under all circumstances. Your ship is outfitted so that you're going to be able to take care of every potentiality. And then you'll be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You'll be able to do them under all circumstances. And look at John chapter 20. We research the Word because it's what we need so that we can believe. John chapter 20. And in verse... 30, because the word was written so that we might believe. These many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Why didn't they make it into the book? I mean, Jesus Christ experiences. That would be good reading material, wouldn't it? But these things are written, the ones that did make it in the book, why? That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So that's why we study the Word. We don't study other people's experiences. We don't study what other people write about the Bible as our primary source of truth. We study what the Word says because that's how we can live by every word. You need that personal experience with God so that you can live. You can't live that way vicariously. You can't eat vicariously, can you? Vicariously, I mean, you know, you watch the people in the, you sit in the stadium or on the couch and watch the game. The people that are playing in the game, they're the ones that are really involved, but you get excited, you get happy, because you're participating vicariously, right? Well, you don't eat vicariously, do you? No, you got to be personally involved. <laughs> Well, the same thing's true with the Word. You've got to be personally involved. You can't live off of somebody else's faith. You can't, somebody else can't believe for you, can they? No, you have to believe for yourself. So we need to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God ourselves. So that's what we study. Jude chapter 3. Jude chapter 3. And you, you just can't just let things go because we live in a world where there's corruption, right? Like it said in Second Peter, there's decay. Everything is always in the state of decay unless you fight against it, unless you stand against it. So Jude chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write to you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write to you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once given or delivered to the saints. Don't let things go. Keep on doing research. Get involved so that you know it. And we study it. Second Peter chapter 1. Here's some more experience or some some more uh, teaching about experiences people really get hepped on 
other people's personal experiences. And it's, it's great, but you have to put it in perspective. And I think this really does put it in perspective. 2 Peter chapter 1. And in verse 16, Peter says, look, we haven't follow, followed cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw it. We were there. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard. We were there on the Mount Transfiguration. He was there when we were with him in the Holy Mount. We were there. But what does he say? Verse 19. We also have what? A more sure word of prophecy. More sure than what? A miracle? A voice out of thin air that was God at the Transfiguration? That's pretty heavy-duty experience if you, would, if you understand what happened at the, at the transfiguration, he was there, he saw it. More sure than that? Yes. What is the more sure word of prophecy? Right here. The word of God. We also have a more sure word of prophecy than that heavy-duty, fantastic experience that he had. Whereon do you do well that you take heed? <laughs> yes, grasshopper. As unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. See, we need to take heed. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. This word of God is something that we can trust, that we can build on, but we don't interpret it. Now, what does that mean? Well, no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private. The word private is idios, which means one own or its own. And now, could it mean that no prophecy of the Scripture is of its own interpretation? No, that can't be. Because if, if it can't interpret itself then it wouldn't make sense, right? And what book doesn't interpret itself? Doesn't every book interpret itself? I mean, when we went to school and we had to do book reports, what did we have to do? We had to read the book, <laughs> right? You had to read the book. And if you read the book, then you'd be able to do the report. Now, of course, a lot of us, we took that shortcut. <laughs> we went over to the bookstore and bought those little yellow and black books. Remember Cliff's Notes? And the teacher would wonder why all the results, all the conclusions were the same. Because everybody had read Cliff's Notes. Okay? But, I mean, who wrote that stuff? <laughs> Cliff did! <laughs> right? But we can't afford to use Cliff's notes for the Bible. We've got to have our own personal relationship with God to study it and make it our own, ourselves, right? And the Word has to interpret itself. It's not of its own interpretation. That doesn't make sense. But no prophecy of the Scripture is of one's own interpretation. My own or your own. Why? Because the word explains itself. It interprets itself. And then, to explain this further, it says, verse 21, for. Why? Because the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. So it's not of our own interpretation by our own will because it didn't come the first time by in any human's will. It came by God's will because holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit and God's smart enough to let it interpret itself. We don't have to use human logic to interpret the word and, and, and like figure out what we think it means. We can let it explain its own terms. 
Do you understand what I'm saying? And see, that's what this verse says. We, the first thing you have to know, if you want to do some biblical research, you have to know that it's not what strikes your mind when you read the word. Okay? See, when you read a literary work, many times people use their own life experience as a filter through which the work is viewed. And then the work is then interpreted in light of the person's own experience and viewpoint. Now, although that response to what you read may be interesting or even entertaining, that may or may not agree with what the author's original intent was, right? So when you look for the author's original intent in any literary work, you have to put yourself, you have to set aside your own experience. You have to set aside that filter and try to understand it from the viewpoint of the writer. So you have to look at it through the eyes of the author, through the words that the author chose. See, Now, in secular literature, it's acceptable to read for entertainment and see what strikes your mind and the emotions that that reading evokes in you, the thoughts, the associations, the entertainment value, okay, how it stimulates your mind. That's acceptable in secular literature, okay? But when you deal with the literature of eternity, you need to let it explain its own terms. You don't go to the Bible and say, this is what I think it means. Or you don't say, well, whatever strikes my mind first when I read it, that's what it really means. No, that doesn't work. See, some people say, well, I can study the Word and the Holy Spirit tells me what it means. Well, wait a minute. Every time you read the Bible, are you getting revelation from God? Oh, well, this already is revelation. I mean, is he going to give you something on top of it? I thought revelation begins where the Word ends, right? I thought that revelation gives you the specifics of a given situation. Here we are reading and God's giving us, revel you mean you get revelation all the time? I'd like to see how you live. <laughs> I'd like to live like you if you get 24 by 7 revelation. How many of you get 24 by 7 revelation? Do you get that? No, you get it when you need it, right? I mean, when you really think about these people who say, well, I read the Bible and then I believe what God tells me is the truth. But, you know, there are people who say that and they differ in what they say about the same scripture. Could that be God? That's, no, that's, that's not how it works. It's so easy to confuse your own emotions, your own thoughts with what God says. And you have to be practiced at that to really know it's God, right? And so we have so many wrong ideas about how to, how to study the Bible. You let the Bible explain its own terms. It interprets itself. And so what you do is you let it interpret itself by looking up prior usage, see. And you don't go by your own experience. You let the word explain its own terms, like that phrase, word of truth. We've read that phrase, word of truth, for years. But unless you pattern it and see what it really meant when it came out of the mouth of the holy man of God, then you'll understand it. It's that word that works. It's that word that gets results. And if we straightly cut the word, if we understand this is this and that is that, then we'll get that word that works, see? But in order to get there, we have to do it correctly, see? The word of God is like a treasure map, right? And X marks the spot. It's there. We can seek it like it's there. But if you dig in the wrong spot, what do you get? Dirt. Dirt. <laughs> you don't get the treasure. It's precise. And so if we, if we read it for the author's intent and not allow our own minds to put in our emotions and our experiences and our filter, then we'll be better off. You let it interpret itself. And that's why, like when Wayne taught us in our foundational material, how the word interprets itself. He had a system in the verse, in the context, used before. 
and he had all those other terms that we learned. Why? Because we need a, to make sure we're right, it's good to have a systematic approach. That's being a workman. See? It's not let you sit here and go home and get all... Is that workman? No. See? you got to be a workman. got to be a workman and work the Word. That's why we're working the Word in this class. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians <clears throat> chapter 2. For this cause, verse 13, also we thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. And that when they spoke, they spoke for God. See? They were holy men of God, and they spoke it. Look at uh, Luke chapter 1. This is so clear here in Luke chapter 1. See, when you go and study the Word, you've got to let it explain its own terms. You can't go to the Word with deductive logic, trying to prove something you already know. Okay? The right way is to go with inductive logic and let it explain its terms. In other words, when they do an exit poll, and they do it properly, <laughs> They're getting a sample of all the people who voted. And, you know, when you want a proper sample, you just don't go to your friendly precincts and get the results you want. No, you get a wide enough sample that's representative of everyone, and then you look at what patterns are in it, and then you make your conclusion based on the patterns. That is inductive. See? That's how we do the word. We look at the multiple occurrences of things in the Word and let the pattern explain itself to us. We let the Word explain its own terms to us. Then we know what the Word says. Then we know what holy men of God spake. We, we are looking at it through the eyes of the author instead of our own filter. Let's see, Luke chapter 1 and in verse 1. This is really interesting to see. <laughs> it says, for as much as many, many did this, have taken in hand, they determined, they decided they were going to do it, to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them to us, who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. See, again, did they depend on experiences or did they do what holy men of God spake? Well, there were a lot of believers back then who had seen Jesus Christ, who had witnessed, who were part of the disciples, who saw, maybe he even ministered to them personally. That would have been something, wouldn't it, for Jesus Christ to have ministered to you? Because you know what? Like he said, if you would have believed somebody else, you would have believed me. It would be the same as somebody else had ministered to you, actually. <laughs> but what if you'd been there? Would you want to pass on what you experienced to those who follow? Well, a lot of people did. They had taken in hand to set forth an order of those things which are most surely believed among us. And so they wrote them down, and then in verse 2, they delivered them to the apostles, who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Well, why wasn't that good enough? Verse 3, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding. Well, where is the only place you can get perfect understanding? From God, right? Of all things, from the very first. Well, from the very first is real interesting. It's the Greek word anathen, and it has another meaning. It means from above. Having had perfect understanding from above. So where did he get the information? From God. To write unto thee in order. 
most excellent beloved of God. Why? When we have the word, when we have what holy man of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, then what do you get? You can get the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. See? That's why experiences are great, but it's what the word says. And we let the word interpret itself. See? And in order to do that, you've got to use an inductive method. Because, see, the Bible was written a long time ago. It was written in Palestine in the first century. Or the Old Testament was written from 1550 B.C. through 400 B.C. Okay? It was written a long time ago in a whole other part of the world in a different language and in a different culture. See, we're Western culture. They're Eastern Palestinian culture, Oriental-based culture. They have a totally different way of doing things. We're of Aristotle type of logic, Aristotelian logic. Their logic is Semitic, totally different. Our language is English, of the Indo-European family. Their language is Semitic, totally different family. We live over in our part of the world. They live over in their part of the world. Totally different climate. Totally different agriculture. The things that they take for granted to us, we have no idea. See, so there's a number of hurdles that we have to cross in order to understand it the way that the author intended it when it was written. Because that's what I want to get back to. It's not what strikes my mind when I read the word. It's what was in the mind of the writer when the holy man of God spoke what he spoke. That's, that's the understanding that I want to attain. That's what I want to find out. And the only way I'm going to find that out is by munching on every word. That detail. Being a workman. That's the only way we're going to be able to get there because it's, it takes work to figure out the differences in culture. It takes work to figure out the differences in language, but it is rewarding to them who seek. And that's what we want. So we utilize that inductive method, not a deductive method. And we apply ourselves so that we can see what the real meaning is and let it explain itself. And that's how we get the result we want. And then we go out and apply it and do research, the, the re part, <laughs> to understand it under all circumstances so that you can apply it no matter what. And then we can get the fruit in all the circumstances that we're, we find ourselves in. Okay, bless you.